Okay, so we continue now with example. So I thought uh, some of the nonlinear aspects also I can explain along with the example. So we start from current mirror up -up. My main motivation behind uh, starting with this architecture was as you learn about differential amplifier, you see actually the application as well. That will be good. And then we also go along with a design example. Therefore, it will give you also an experience of the preliminary first design experience for a simple op-amp. And uh, the third motivation was the frequency response really doesn't depend too much except one point, which is phase margin, and the location of other poles. In this example, I don't talk about phase margin because we have not still covered the entire frequency response portion. That's why one assumption I make here, which is based on noise margin assumption, but then you don't need to be to know why. And then after that, the remaining part is uh, completely compatible with what we have covered till now, plus some nonlinear aspects that anyway I will cover along with the example. Okay, so this is called a current mirror op amp. The architecture, if you notice, now because you know the half circuits, therefore you would be able to uh, quickly understand the first stage has a diode connected load. As soon as you go with half circuit in differential mode, you will see a common source with a diode connected load, which already you know the gain is the ratio of aspect, square root of aspect ratios. But uh, Finally, at the output, we want a single-ended output, and also we want to have enough swing. Therefore, we use a mirroring configuration, and that's why it is called current mirror op -amp. What is that? So, you know that because this is diode connected, therefore, most of the current which is generated by M2, that short circuit small signal current, which is GMVID, by 2 in each branch, will uh, flow actually through M3 and M4, almost all of it will flow, and therefore it will create a voltage here. So if you want to transfer this current to the next stage, instead of using a cascade, which is actually transferring voltage to the next stage, we transfer current to the next stage, and that's why it is called current mirror op amp. In fact, if you look at M6 and M8, they can be considered as the second stage. And do, to transfer the information or signal to the second stage, we actually use current mirroring. So we, therefore, we transfer mirror, uh, transfer current to the second stage, not voltage. Actually, it's voltage as well. Means that these two are always together. But the purpose here is that to use a diode connected load. Therefore, we will get reasonably the entire current of short circuit, small signal short circuit current flowing through M4 and M3, which is GMVID by 2. And then that will be mirrored by a factor K to the output stage. From M3 side also, we need to do that, but because of, because we are not, we don't have access to the uh, sync part, this is source and this is sync, or this is pull up and this is pull down. Therefore, we need to have one extra mirroring branch, so that first we will mirror it by ratio 1, and then we will mirror by ratio of k. So therefore now current, a small signal current in M6 and M8 is supposed to be k times of the small signal current in M4 and M3. Okay, and then one of them is always source and one of them is sync. For example, if the small signal current of M4 is positive, small signal current of M3 will be negative. And therefore when they arrive here, they will be added. So, for example, here, suppose the small signal current, so therefore, suppose this is I, therefore, I show it by a small letter. So, suppose I2 is upwards, then I1 will be downwards. So, these are of 180 degree phase difference in the differential mode. So, I'm talking about differential mode. So, therefore, when you mirror, then you will get this kind of current here. So, small signal current also will follow the direction of I2. It will be mirrored, but with a factor k. So similarly, I5 will be upwards, and therefore I7 also will be upwards, which is same as I5. And yes, no, this is upwards, right? So therefore, this is negative. 
oh sorry oh sorry here oh, it's a mistake it's downwards and therefore this is downwards and this is downwards which will be i8 and therefore the small signal current flowing through cl will be i6 plus i so this is the current mirroring so first we want to know that what is the advantage of this op amp uh, first of all to look okay first of all is it gives us a small uh, single ended output differential input which is very much required in many applications not always we want a differential output the second point is that if you control the over the gate over drive of m8 and m6 properly during design not make it very large, you would be able to really get a good swing at the output. That is another advantage of this architecture. And the third point is that the load capacitance itself determines what is the pole, and therefore that itself is good enough to determine the frequency characteristics of this op-amp, provided you make provision for the stability. Right now, I don't talk about it, but you keep that in mind. So that's why right now we just look at the effect of CL on the frequency response. Okay, so two things we need to consider. See, in an op-amp, what kind of frequency characteristics are we interested? You know that in amplifiers, because gain is very important, so we are interested in minus 3 dB bandwidth, right? So what about op-amps? For example, what do you think whether minus 3 dB bandwidth could be a reasonable characteristics for an op-amp to talk about bandwidth of an op-amp? According to your experience, what is used for frequency response of op-amp? Yes, unity gain. So why unity gain is used? Unity gain means frequency at which the gain of op-amp is 1. Why we don't use minus 3 dB frequency? Just like so amplifier. Because we use op-amp and feedback loop. Okay. So, uh, means it's an R-hand to control the frequency of the interest which we can operate. So, that is so one answer. So, we uh, reduce uh, the gain, uh, gain and we can increase the maximum bandwidth uh, which we can obtain with unity gain. But the same thing is valid for amplifier. With amplifier also, you can have the same thing. Often basically used to suppress the noise in the noise. No, no, I'm not talking about difference between op amp and amplifier. I'm asking why we are not following the same scheme we have in amplifier for frequency specifications. When figure of merit is unity gain rather than minus 3 dB bandwidth. Unity gain is the worst case when you put the Same thing is for amplifier. Op-amp is an amplifier. It's a special case of amplifier. Same for amplifier. See, op-amp is an amplifier with a very high gain. Therefore, even minus 10 dB still is high. Minus 10 dB below the low frequency gain still is high. You can use it. But amplifier is not a very high speed, a very high gain. amplification scenario doesn't have that in fact if the gain of amplifier is very high it becomes op amp practically see one of the main reason is that you can use op amp even at frequencies beyond minus 3 dB frequency <coughs> and on top of that of course it's very unlikely to use op amp in an open loop because of that high gain and because of that high gain and op amp eventually is designed that is the answer which was given that is correct the op-amp eventually is an amplifier which is designed to work only in feedback configuration. But why do we want that? Why we don't design op-amp with lower gain to use it in open loop? No, this this is answer in loop. <laughs> no, no, we define we defi define op-amp as an amplifier with gain of high, high gain. Nobody forces us, so we can we can we can avoid it. We can reduce the gain. If we use it in the feedback loop, 
we can uh, determine what gain we want. Yes. If you use it in open loop, gain is not really controlled by you. In open loop gain, there are many factors, right? As you can see, you have now done the assignment too. You can see that lambda is changing. Eventually, output resistance changes with the swing, right? So therefore, gain is not a fixed value. So what you are doing is that, or everybody does with its concept of op amp, they actually make an amplifier with very high gain. Therefore, even if gain changes, it still is high. But when you make it very high, but then you cannot use it in open loop. Means that if, if you could have used it, and only high value was important for you, so open loop was fine. The problem is that that high value, sometimes absolute value matters, not sometimes, in fact, in many cases. It's not just a matter of keeping it high and therefore, even if the changes still is high, so fine. The point is that you want to exact gain. You want really to control the gain. Because if you don't control the gain, if the input signal amplitude changes, your output will be clipped. So therefore, you will lose in linearity. So we, on purpose, we make high gain amplifier so that we can use it only in feedback mode. Therefore, we can stabilize the gain. We can control the frequency response. We can do whatever we want with that. Because now everything mainly will depend on external components we put around the op amp. Not really op amp itself. Therefore, if gain of op amp changes with temperature, still overall gain will remain constant. For example, simple example is an inverting or non-inverting amplifier. Instead of relying on GMRO as a gain, you rely on R2 upon R1 as a gain. And ratio of two resistors, even on chip, or two capacitors on chip, is unlikely to change. In fact, if you consider that change, that these are second and third order effects. Therefore, you will get pre pretty good linearity from this feedback system, which is supposed to have good linearity. And high gain helps you to have a high loop gain. Therefore, if you use an amplifier, you can use, that's why I told you same is valid about amplifier. You can use an amplifier in feedback mode as well, but loop gain is not very high. Therefore, you will not earn the way you earn with a high loop gain. So linearity improves, and as you mentioned also, what happens is that when you apply the feedback, naturally bandwidth improves. Therefore, if you just look at minus 3 dB bandwidth of op amp in open loop, in closed loop, you will get a minus 3 dB bandwidth, which is more than that. Suppose if you use it with unity gain feedback, which gives you very high loop gain, then almost the minus 3 dB frequency of the resulting buffer is unity gain frequency of the original op amp. And that is the reason we are interested in unity gain frequency. And unity gain frequency is the frequency at which also we are interested, because see, below that usually we don't use. I mean, why we should use an op amp to generate an attenuator, right? Unless there are, of course, there are cases for some special reasons we use it, but in general, mainly we use it as an amplifier. Therefore, Below gain of one, closed loop gain of one is not much of interest. Therefore, when we want to look at the stability, also we look at the worst case of the bandwidth, which happens at loop gain one. And that gives us the worst case usually for the stability. That's why for a pump, unity gain frequency is important, not minus 3 dB frequency. In fact, minus 3 dB frequency can be very low and unity gain frequency is very high. Minus 3 dB frequency of an op-amp can be in the range of kilohertz. Can be in the range of hundreds of hertz, but it doesn't mean that we cannot use it beyond those frequency. We easily use it up to even sometimes gigahertz, which is not a problem. Of course, you need again in those cases is more, but even if it is kilohertz, you can easily use it to the range of tens of megahertz, hundreds of megahertz. Okay, so this that, and we show it by a few, which is the unit gain frequency. Okay, so if I look at this op amp, current mirror op amp, so the frequency characteristics of this op amp, so if I plot as a function of omega, in open loop. So it starts from some
low frequency gain AV0 <coughs> then you have minus 3 dB and then you will have roll off of how much if I ignore for now let's ignore the till at least you need to gain frequency <coughs> let's ignore them then how much will be the slope how much 20 dB per dB So in this design, we are interested in this range and mainly we are focused on the frequency which are a little below omega unity gain. That's why I don't come into the discussion about second pole and therefore that is compatible with what you have learned. Okay, so that was the advantage. We can get pretty good zoom. So let's look at the characteristics which are given to us. Okay, first question is about gain. Whenever we talk about op-amp, we are talking about gain. So let's uh, first talk about gain. What would be the gain of this amplifier? And then we know that the input stage gain cannot be very high. So let's derive this gain. So this is effectively AV0. So I'm de deriving that AV0. Okay, so I go with that, uh, this relation, which is, I'm very comfortable with it. So at operating point, this gain. And I have also some purpose, writing gain as a function of current and gate overdrive. So again, we can write in three different ways because we can write it in three different ways based on the GM. So I'm writing GM in that way. So. This is eventually the GM of input stage, or you can also call it short circuit GM of the input stage, which is almost same as the GM you get because load is diode connected. So you have a low impedance node, therefore most of the current flows. Effectively, you can ignore effect of output resistance of M1 and M2 here because load is mainly 1 upon GM3 and 1 upon GM4, which is correct to say because it is much smaller than or so this is effective gm we have so what about the effective gm of the entire op amp so you know i'm going with that concept of gm ro capital gm and into ro but i don't write it in you know step by step for you so this is for the first stage what will be the gm of overall op amp capital gm considering this is gm of the input stage Multiply by? Okay. Multiply by K, correct. Because if you AC short the output, here you will get a current which is GM into VID by 2. Right? So this GM VID by 2, be very careful also. This current is GM VID by 2. We have a factor of 2 decrease in the current for every half circuit. Yesterday we uh, had the relation. So this is GM VID by 2, okay? So if here current will be multiplied by K, small signal current. In fact, I6 I have written here is K times of I2. <laughs> Similarly, I8 is K times of I5. So therefore, current will be multiplied by K. Therefore, GM of the first stage will be multiplied by K. Why here I have not written GM by 2? Because I know that the, there is a GM by 2 here. This is the capital GM. Yes, yes. Yes, because each one of them is half of this number. Now you have I6 plus I8 flowing through a CL. Therefore, you will get again double of that. Therefore, it becomes GM1 into K. So this is the capital GM. Is that clear? And then what I need? RO. What is RO of this open? output resistance of this open. <coughs> yes, RO6 parallel to RO8. So therefore, what I will do, I will write it in the form of lambda 6 and lambda 8. Into each current, which will be K times of <laughs> K 
that id right Correct? Okay. I'm writing versus bias point values. Agree? Okay, so understood, right? So now it's very interesting. K gets omitted. And therefore, we will end up effectively like you have only a single stage common source, which is this GM, multiplied by output impedance, which is parallel combination of NMOS and PMOS. It's like in common source with active load and your active load is output impedance of a P channel parallel to output impedance of an N channel transistor. So I want to say that, see, look, this, this is actually same as GM. One, right? And this is actually ROP parallel to RON. The reason I'm writing that because I want you to get an idea of the order of this game. So now according to your knowledge and then you have done the assignments and then you have attended tutorials and you have solved problems from different books, what do you think will be order of this game? So as your friend also mentioned, you can drop ID1 as well. So effectively you will end up like two upon VGS T1 in two lines. Can I get gain of 10,000? You cannot. Can I get gain of 5,000? See, I have considered right now transistors are in saturation. So VGS T1 is positive and relatively, say, around 100 at least, 100 millivolt. Practically, we may make it more than that. Suppose even if I go with around 100 millivolt overdrive. So what would be this ratio? <coughs> Calculate. Suppose lambda is 0.1. See how much gain you get. Each lambda suppose is 0.1. Or maybe 0 0.05. Okay, let's consider it is a good value. 200. With a VGST of minimum VGST, you know, this is the best you can imagine. But usually we keep also margin for VGST. But that's okay. So suppose you get to go with 100 millivolt example. So 100 millivolt overdrive. And then summation of 2 lambda will give you 0 0.05 into 2 which is 0.1. So it will be 2, 0.1 into 0.1, 0 0.01. So it will give you gain of 200. But this is not a good gain for an op-amp. For op-amp, we we'll need more gain. But you can increase this gain easily by changing the architecture. Now you have an idea and you know that how to increase gain by changing the architecture. Which architecture gave us better gain? Cascode. Exactly. Therefore, you can just convert this architecture to a cascode. That I will keep here for you. For you. So therefore, you just convert it to a cascode. Don't worry about swing right now. Just convert it to cascode for yourself and derive the cascode configuration of the same and but we will discuss it again I will tell you but uh, that doesn't have anything different from what we are doing here and just purposefully come continue with common source so that you will be able to get the idea around design of the open that's the main purpose here I just gave you this example to keep in mind that the gain is not very high and this is one thing that always you need to Keep in mind, not just by looking at this, which looks like a two-stage amplifier, therefore you expect that you will get a lot of gain. And specifically when you see this is diode connected and current mirroring, so you may guess that this doesn't give a very high gain. Okay, so therefore in the specifications, I don't talk about gain. I see that, okay, whatever high you can achieve, that's okay, because right now we are actually want to look at how we can design for a particular specifications which include nonlinear specifications. 
because gain is always something that we can manage by changing the architecture to cascode or folded cascode. Okay, so this is, okay, I write right here. What is given? Mu PC ox, suppose is given 150 microampere per volt square. Mu and C ox, these are low field. Now you know that this mu P mu and written here is low field mobility. So you need to gain now we want to be more than, let's make it more than 50 megahertz. And CL is equal to 5 picofarad. And here I keep the slow rate as well, which is a nonlinear characteristics, to be more than or at least 30 volt per microsecond. So suppose these are desired specifications. So therefore, we need we know now what is unity gain. It's the gain at which the frequency reaches the is the frequency at which gain reaches to zero dB or one. What we need only to see is that what is the slow rate. So this is, a, we are going to make it an op-amp and use it in a feedback <coughs> mode. So therefore, what will happen in a feedback mode? This is your op-amp. The same op-amp. Which input is negative input? Which one is positive input? Which one of these two is positive? Which one is negative? Green one is positive or negative? Positive. Okay, let's try. So from here to here, you have 180 degree phase shift. From here to here, you have another 180. So this is zero. From here to here, you have 180. So then it is negative. So V in 2 is positive. Because from V in 2 to gate of M4, you have 180 degree phase difference. From gate of M6 to output 180, 180, 180, it is 0. So this is positive terminal. This is negative. This is also very important. See, if you don't uh, or swap them, then your feedback system becomes unstable. Be very careful. Yes, yes, but depends on. Uh, like in general, like single stage yes, yes, that is. If, uh, if it define input v in one minus v in two, then, huh? But if you define it v in two minus v in one, then it becomes that's okay. See, it depends how you define your vid. That's okay. Yeah, so if I define V in 2 minus V in 1, then it becomes positive. If I define V in 1 minus V in 2, it becomes negative. So CL is 5 picofarad. This is the way you connect it, right, and use it. So here there is one effect that I'm sure you are familiar with it. I think most of you are familiar with the slow rate, but I just repeat it. So slow rate means that, and that name also shows, it's the slowing rate. Means that what is the maximum rate at which this output can change? That is not always defined by bandwidth. Because this is a large signal behavior. Eventually tells you every op-amp limitation on dv out by dt. Either positive slope or negative slope. What is the reason behind that? The reason behind that is mainly because always you have a relatively large capacitor either connected to the output or inside the circuit. In this example, we have it at the output. And this op-amp has to charge and discharge this capacitor at a particular rate. But how much is that rate? That depends on how much is the maximum current you can give to CL. So as CL reduces, naturally this rate increases. 
and as CL increases, this rate reduces. Therefore, this actually comes from here because this dv out by dt, these years, dv out by dt is effectively current that you receive. I call it I out, large signal, upon CL. And I out is the current flowing into CL. Can be, which eventually is a DC current, which is here zero. And therefore, if we out reduces, this current is upwards. And if we out increases, it will be downwards. So the question is that, how much this absolute value can increase? So that depends really, CL is fixed. Therefore, if I want to make it max, I have to actually look at this max absolute value of current which can flow through CL. But that is limited again by the circuit. Why is limited? Because in these configurations, uh, we are biasing the circuit using a current source. And therefore, naturally, we are determining how much current we have made available in the circuit. So a very good example is the step response, which actually gives you the best current, which can flow through this CL. Why? We'll see that. Suppose, and that's why that is used. This is the best. Instead, this slow rate is the best you can achieve. So if I apply a sharp input, therefore output has to increase. But output is connected across a capacitor. And you know that capacitor cannot increase its voltage suddenly. But why, by the way, why cannot increase this current voltage again? Why here if I apply a step at the input, why output doesn't follow input? Okay, let's go back to this. Why this voltage cannot change something? But current changes suddenly. In fact, that is exactly the argument you make. Suppose if this voltage goes from 0 to 1, we say that C, and suppose this VC at 0 minus was 0. What you say is that C, this voltage cannot change suddenly, therefore it means 0. This has gone to 1, therefore this current suddenly, if I plot this current, current suddenly jumps from 0 to 1 upon R. How current can suddenly jump, but oh, the capacitor cannot. If the time constant is an issue, so how this time constant avoids, doesn't avoid current to jump? But what's, uh, voltage across capacitor, we get the expression of uh, B0 to 1 minus B0 to 1 is better. So the time is very small, the exponential term is very less. 1 minus, that thing is very less. So we get very less. Suppose I don't know the relation. What if this circuit is complicated? Fine. How current can become high frequency? If there is an RC time constant, why? Right? Function of the charge inside the capacitance. Charge cannot increase instantly because it has to be the For that, current needs to be inflated. Current has to be infinite. Exactly. It doesn't mean capacitor cannot change. Can. But to change this voltage, you need an infinite current. Who will give this infinite current? That is the reason. But sudden change in the current as long as, see, actually this also is not valid. Practically, this also doesn't happen. This is not even correct. Approximately is OK. But voltage across capacitor has a bigger problem. The bigger problem with the capacitor is it's not like that the capacitor doesn't change its voltage across it, but to change it, you need in a zero second dump some charge. That means you need to feed a pulse, impulse current to the capacitor. But who can provide an impulse current? There is no component, physical component, which can give impulse current. That's why you don't get, I mean, I mean that's okay. We want actually to change it that suddenly, but it cannot change just because you cannot dump a lot of charge in zero second. For that, you need an impulse current. If 
suppose, if suppose, it could have been possible to give an impulse current, then yes. But even suppose now source gives impulse current. Now what? Think about it. Suppose I have a source which can give an impulse current. Just imagine. Therefore, it can charge this capacitor in zero seconds. Yes. So, what is the uh, conflict here? So, why in the presence of R we cannot have in an infinite current? Why R is limiting flow? <laughs> Which is charging the capacitor. So okay. As R tends to zero, then that ratio will go high. No, no. Suppose R is a non-zero value, right? That the whole argument is if R is non-zero. Because if R is zero, naturally that will work. Infinite current will charge capacitor in zero second. Practically, what will happen? That will not happen because practically source is an output resistance. That's why it, it, that situation is not ideal, but it's not practical. But let's consider that exists. But if we keep, keep a resistor, but still assume that the source can give in finite current. Question is that if this capacitor can change its voltage in zero second, if we dump a lot of uh, some amount of charge in zero second and source can provide it, why that doesn't happen in the circuit? So, see, when you have an infinite current through a resistor, that means that you have infinite loss. So, this is a lossy circuit. So, you have an infinite loss, means infinite energy. That's not again possible. So, that's why when you remove resistor, you remove the source of loss. So, therefore, the entire energy can tra get transferred to capacitor. Here, what will happen is that the entire energy is consumed by the resistor. That's the meaning of that, which is not possible. Uh, how the, uh, the source will provide double the infinite energy? Half will be consumed by resistance, half will be consumed by capacitor. Fine. So the, it, pro it provides. Now what will happen? Then what would be the voltage across C according to KVL? If that is the current source. How much will be voltage across C according to KVL? Into, uh, it will be an impulse. Now voltage across capacitor becomes impulse because input voltage is constant. Voltage across resistor is an impulse. So you want KVL to be valid. Yeah. So therefore voltage across capacitor now is an impulse. Infinity minus infinity can, can be voltage. Why it is? No, no, no. No, no. Fine. Infinity. So therefore voltage across capacitor now is not one volt. It's infinity. Again, it is it contradicts our original assumption. I think... Uh, that is fine, but then you are saying that the voltage across capacitor now, instead of jumping from 0 to 1, it becomes like that. Right? Voltage, I am just writing KVL. Why do you make it seem uh, complicated? Voltage across, this is a constant value, right? This is infinity, so this should be also infinity. Otherwise, KVL is not valid. This becomes now we see. <coughs> then you need an infinite weight of the impulse. That's why it just gets increased. Impossible. Uh, that is the current source or the source? This voltage source. Voltage. Okay. This is a voltage. Okay, anyway. So here the whole point was this output voltage cannot change. Now, the point is that if this input is pretty fast, see, the, first of all, this step is not possible. What we mean is that this TR is low, is very low. What do we mean when we say it is very low? means that it is much smaller than the time this capacitor needs to actually change its voltage, much smaller than that. Therefore, it looks like sharp input when you observe from CL point of view. So if the input reaches, for example, we change it by, say, suppose we change it from, say, 400 millivolt to 600 millivolt. Suppose this is the change we apply. Therefore, voltage at the input of the op-amp becomes 200 millivolt. Because this voltage cannot change. 
So it has been that 400 millivolt which was before, at time equal to zero, before zero. Now I apply a very sharp input to increase the input from 400 to 600. So output cannot change, output remains 400. But input has become 600. Therefore, input of the op amp will receive 200 millivolt. In this case, gain is low, may not be an issue. But practically will be an issue because gain of op amp is large. At least it will be something around 2000, 3000. And the output voltage cannot reach to that value. And more important than that is that when you give this 200 millivolt, it may also cross the range. If you remember the ID VD, VID characteristics, if VID crosses some limit which was determined by the aspect ratio of transistors and ISS, <coughs> which was eventually dependent on the overdrive, you will get practically a completely one transistor off and one transistor on. So, and what does that mean? It means that if you reach to that situation, that means that you have got the maximum possible current which can come from here. And from this side, of course, it becomes the minimum possible current which can come. And then summation of these two cannot cross the limit. See, suppose this input going with this situation. So suppose this positive input is 600 millivolt, negative input is 400 millivolts. So therefore, you have 200 millivolt difference between these two. 200 millivolt, okay? So it's not very large. But suppose, but by amount of that 200 millivolt, what will happen now? M2 will conduct more, more current as compared to M1. So that means that we are increasing this I6 because this is conducting more current. And this is conducting less current. So we are increasing, in fact, this current because it's negative. But how much we can reduce this current? This current cannot reduce more than how much is the original I8 DC is K times of ID1. These are all DC, ID8. That's why I use capital letter. K times of ISS by 2. See, this is ID8. How much you can reduce it? You cannot reduce it more than KISS by 2 because it will reach to 0. Therefore, delta ID8 mean is minus K ISS by 2. Best case. And that is when this M8 is almost off. And M6 is drawing the entire current ISS. After that, nothing happens. Therefore, the maximum current which can enter into this capacitor is limited by this ISS. Because the extreme scenario we have, either M8 will be on, off, and M6 will draw ISS, K times of ISS, or I8 will draw K times of ISS and M6 will be off, which will give us the positive slope or negative slope of the output. And that cannot be increased. So therefore, we are limited in that sense. And that is called a slow rate. That means that here, this I out max will be K times of ISS by 2. ISS, sorry. Not by 2. What is the limit on K? Yeah. K actually depends on the phase margin. K is one of, is determined based on phase margin and because we have not talked about phase margin. What I did, uh, I consider some value for K right now, which is typical. I have considered K equal to 4 for this example. We will revisit this example when we learn phase margin and then how to design based on phase margin. Because K will determine the location of second pole. For now, you assume K is given to you. But I just wanted to tell you, like, this is K, K affects, of course, on the slow rate. Okay, so therefore, effectively, by adding this stage, at least you have been able to enhance the slow rate. Okay, so now I can continue. So one thing also we learned that this gain is, we derived it in fact here. This is our gain. 
Okay, so therefore it depends mainly on the overdrive. Okay, and also we see that it is independent of K. So, but one thing always you consider for design, if you want to achieve a good gain, don't use short channel transistor. Therefore, it is very important. Also, if you want to get good value of lambda, don't use short channel transistors at the output. So, therefore, this is even more important than the output because they determine the output impedance. Therefore, the first thing we go with design is that we consider this L6 and L8 to be long channel. Because we see that they affect the gain. And another factor, of course, is the overdrive of input stage. So now what would be this frequency if the transfer function of the circuit is just a single pole? So therefore, because I need to use this unity gain frequency information. So AVJ omega. is a v zero upon one j omega upon omega minus three this is the way it will behave and that minus three db frequency is one upon r o p parallel to r o n into c So four frequencies which are much larger than omega minus 3 dB, which includes also omega unity gain. We can approximate it by this relation. And we want to keep this magnitude equal to 1. Therefore, omega unity gain is actually AV0 into omega minus 3 dB. And I can write it in the form of GM or O of Transist uh, op amp, which is ROP parallel to RON, multiply by one ROP parallel to RON into C. Therefore, effectively, unity gain frequency is determined by capital G. And what is capital GM? <coughs> We just analyze it at the beginning. K? Yeah. What is multiplied by K? GM1 into K. GM1 is equal to GM2. Yeah, I write GM1 so that you know that from which part of the circuit this small GM is coming. Okay, so therefore now we have this information. Omega unity gain is K times of GM1 by C. For this circuit. And the slow rate. Because these two inf information are important for us. Is K. I says by C. So for this design, because K, we have not gone into phase margin, therefore I don't talk about uh, noise mar phase margin and second pole. You assume K is equal to 4. Okay. So therefore from here I can get some idea about ISS. So how much was the slow rate? See, a slow rate is given minimum 30 volt microsecond, but always you design for higher values. Therefore, we go with higher values. Minimum is 30. Whatever we get, we actually increase ISS. 
Which part? Yes, the topic question. Oh, uh, this one. Yeah, when, uh, how did you uh, See, this you got? Yeah. Do you agree with this? Yeah. Do you agree with omega minus 3 dB relation? Okay. And then what I assume, which is a very correct assumption, is that unity gain frequency is much more than minus 3 dB. Because mm -hmm. minus 3 dB is output impedance into CL, and it's pretty large time constant. So therefore, I want to, and I know that that omega unity gain gain is one. So I want to derive the omega unity gain from that assumption based on the other parameters of the circuit. This is the definition of omega unity gain when gain is equal to one, right? So I use that definition, and then I replace A V by the by the relation which is given which is a first order approximation for frequencies less than omega unity gain. I put this delta omega because as we are, we are very close to omega unity gain, definite second poles are in the picture. For frequencies below omega unity gain, suppose one octave below that, you may not even get that, it's not so significant effect of them, therefore it's really a good approximation. Let's make it approximate. So what I did, I just replaced. So this omega is much more than omega minus 3 dB, omega unity gain. So therefore, I ignore 1. Okay. And then you got this. And then I replaced this minus 3 dB frequency by this relation. Also, I replaced gain by GMRO, capital GM, capital RO, which is parallel combination of RO, P, RO, and finally I reduced it to capital GM by C. And then I replaced capital GM by GM1 into K, that we derived before. Okay, because K is given, therefore now I know. Slow rate is 30 volt, how much? 30 volt per microsecond. Okay, I write it volt per microsecond, that therefore current also becomes volt per microsecond, four times of ISS into CL of 5 picofarad. So from here, ISS appears to be 75 microampere. However, you don't choose ISS 75 always over design, not too much because unnecessarily you are increasing power. That's why I choose, say, ISS equal to 80 micron. Okay, so therefore we got the first part of the design, which is... No, but see, this is exactly the boundary value. And also, you don't know really when you simulate what you will get practically. For example, here, this current. You will go with current mirroring. But then it may happen that because of the limited headroom here, specifically when common mode signal comes down, the current will drop. Then effective slow rate. So a slow rate changes. So it's not like that it remains fixed. So that's why it's better always to keep some over design headroom. That is not too much. It's 5 out of 75 microampere overhead. Percentage-wise, it's not very large. Okay, and then, now we have the other relation, because when you get the value of ISS... Huh? ISS will be 27 microampere. Yeah, but it's not the same as the same. 37.5, are you sure? Is there is a factor of four, two difference? K is four. K I have given four. No problem. If there is a factor of two, you just include that factor of two. If there is a factor of two difference. See, this is uh, 150 upon four. 150 upon 4, yeah, will give you around 
less than 40, yeah. Okay, 37.5, it's half of that. Yeah, maybe somewhere I have missed a factor of two. I'll cross check it again. For now, I, it seems this is okay. So let's choose it for 40 micron. Yeah, so it's 40. See, which one is correct finally? 37.5 is correct, right? Okay, what is the next relation I can use is the omega unit again. Because omega unit again is k times of gm1 by cl. Again, k is given to you, cl is given, omega unit again more than 50 megahertz. So therefore, you will get again gm. gm1 should be more than this 50 megahertz into 2 pi into cl, which is 5 picofarad, into upon k which is 4 okay so one interesting point here is that you will get some limit for gm1 you will keep gm1 more than that again you keep some headroom so therefore you have gm1 you have iss therefore you will get aspect ratio of input transistors right so therefore input transistors now will be designed what will remain will be the size of output trans the reason is because i just want quickly to tell you the flow to finish this, right? Because the remaining, you know, right? The remaining is routine calculation. You just proceed and then uh, go ahead with calculation. And uh, one thing here yeah, I want to tell you is that here we got a low value for gain, right? And then I told you you go with cascode, which is fine. This is a reasonable solution for this problem. Another problem, another solution could be, I, I'm not saying will be, could be, but I want you to explore it. What if I bias my transistors in sub-threshold? Therefore, instead of this VGST, I will get VT, which is 25 millivolt, and that will improve the gain. So it doesn't improve too much, but at least I will get better gain with this configuration. I want you to explore what will happen for the size of transistor input transistors if you go with the subthreshold and for subthreshold you use exactly the same values we have considered in the examples in the class always we go with those values like you can consider n is equal to something between one uh, say maximum 1.5 we had considered for example you can consider 1.4 that was value of n nvt so this actually becomes nvt not vt so you see that how much gain you can improve if you go to sub-threshold. This is one thing I want you to do. The second thing is to go ahead and finish this part to get the sizing. And then now one more thing which is left is the size of other transistors. Okay. How to choose size of other transistors? See, for the output, because this can give you a very good swing, therefore what you consider is to have mm, a reasonably low overdrive for M6 and M8 to have a good swing. For example, you can choose the overdrive of M6, VGST6, and VGST. See, this is capital, means for bias point. To be low. How much low? For example, you can go with 150 millivolt, you can go with 200 millivolt, not more than that. So, therefore, for example, 150 millivolt is a reasonable number, or say 200 millivolt, not more than that. That means that the output voltage with respect to its DC value can reduce down to 200 or 150 millivolt and can increase up to VDD minus 150 or 200 millivolt. Therefore, by this choice, you are providing the maximum possible swing at the output. And that is why then now output stage is designed based on the output swing. And already you know the K, right? And you know the gate overdrive of M6 and M8. So you know this, you know this. Therefore, you will get aspect ratio of M6 and M7 as well. M8. 
And see, one dot, quote dot, means that the ratio of M7 to Mk is 1 upon, M8 is 1 upon K. Therefore, if you have aspect ratio of M8, you have aspect ratio of M7, which is 1 upon 4 times of M8. Right? And this is for M6. Again, you for M4, you will get 1 upon K times of M6. And M3 is same as M5. And M3 and M4 also are same. So therefore, your open piece is only what I want you, you finish it. You just did do the calculation, get the sizes, explore subthreshold, make it really a very nice completed assignment. Okay, which is good also for learning purpose. So practically you have, we have in fact done the first OPAM design practice now. At the same time you learned also how to use differential amplifier. 600, what is 600? <laughs> yes, yes, that is something that at the beginning we discussed, right? No, no, over the right, you see, you will go with the output impedance, this is output resistance, due to output resistance, to get better gain. That is because of gain. And you will go with a low overdrive, that is because of swing. Therefore, aspect ratio will come. You don't have freedom to choose. Don't go with a wrong approach for design. Never, ever. In fact, never, ever choose aspect ratio of transistor. That's absolutely wrong decision. Never, ever start a design by choosing aspect ratio. Aspect ratio always is forced. It's very unlikely you have freedom in choosing aspect ratio, very unlikely. If the problem is like that, that means that you don't have severe con constraints. It's just like, a, practically it never happens. It never happens that you have so much freedom in sizing. Unless, I don't know, we have to see what kind of condition. At least in my experience, in 90% of the cases, we don't have enough freedom. But yeah, so therefore, see here we use swing, we use the slow rate, we use uh, unity gain frequency. Three parameters or three specifications of the op amp. Three of the most important specifications we use. Fourth one, which is gain, can be handled by Casco. Therefore, you will have two interesting work to do. I'm sure that you will enjoy doing that first to finish this. The second thing. Uh, three words. Second thing is to explore subthreshold. Third is to replace it by a cascode. Therefore, you will get best of all. You will get gain as well. Okay. <laughs>